Hello. Welcome to Regional Arts Australia's Artlands Conversation Series, session number two. My name is Mary Jane Warfield. I'm the Regional Arts Fund Manager for Regional Arts Australia. I'm joining you from Mapantua Alice Springs and I'm on Aranda Country. Regional Arts Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands and throughout Australia and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this Artlands, the second session of the Artlands Conversation Series. Artlands is supported by the Australian Government's Regional Arts Fund. Now, firstly, a little bit of housekeeping. So um, today's session will be Auslan interpreted, as you can probably see. Um, if you'd like, and closed captioning is available. If you would like to highlight the Auslan interpreters, you can scroll over the image you can see of their video and there'll be a drop down menu and you can pin that video so that it's the largest one that you can see. Um, now down the bottom of your screen, if you, I'm sure you're probably all familiar, but I'll go over it anyway. Um, down the bottom of the screen, there's Q&A and chat buttons that you might wish to use. The Q&A can be used to send us questions for the panellists and I'll moderate those and we'll do that at the end. Um, we might not get to all of the questions, but um, please put them in the Q&A session, a uh, Q&A section on your Zoom. Um, well, you can also vote up other questions. So if someone asks a question that's similar to what you want to ask, you can vote that question up um, and then we'll have a bit of a priority of which questions we ask the panellists. Um, you can also use the chat room, so please feel free to use the chat function down the bottom to introduce yourself and let us know where you're tuning in from today. Um, today's topic is transformative experiences, how art and creativity can create pathways to recovery. Now we're really delighted that the conversation will be facilitated by Amanda Grant today and Amanda is joined by Vanessa Keenan, Christopher Cowles and Marnie mayer Kiley. Um, all of the information about our speakers and panellists for the entire series is available on our website so we won't go into that now and I'll hand over to Amanda to start the conversation. Thanks Amanda. Thanks Mary Jane and um, thank you very much for um, to Regional Arts Australia for having us all here today. Um, this is a, a topic that's very close to my heart and what we're going to cover today is the transformative effect of creative practice in, in a post-disaster environment and we've got um, three really amazing um, creative facilitators to speak to today. Um, so I have um, a long background in, in creative recovery um, that started after the 2009 fires in Victoria and um, I've worked with um, many artists, I've worked with Regional Arts Victoria and the Creative Recovery um, Network as a creative recovery facilitator. The panellists we have today um, have very various practices and they've also worked in, in different, um, both uh, all bushfire affected communities, um, but in different times and places. Um, so from back in the, the 2009 Victorian bushfires, um, Marnie has worked um, in Whittlesea. Um, she's a, an artistic and event director, um, a choreographer and a performance and ritual artist. She also works with, um, with council and she was a key driver and facilitator in the Into the Light Festival, which was a, an initiative that started off as um, fairly unstructured um, artistic workshops which developed into quite a profound um, lantern parade and series of, of um, of artistic, of art, an artistic event which, um, which which had a whole lot of um, artistic practices involved in it. And this, this um, developed and went along for many years. Um, we also have Christopher Cowles here from Tasmania. Um, he has an interest in design history, environmental education and cultural development. And he was one of the key drivers in the Symbols of Bushfire Recovery, which was a series of 19 workshops um, in the um, in the aftermath of the 2013 fires. Uh, we also have here today Vanessa. Um, Vanessa Keenan is um, from New South Wales. Um, she is experienced in arts management, arts strategy and community engagement. Um, she's also a recipient of the Regional Arts Australia Fellowship, so congratulations. And um, she's the curator of the Arbor Festival and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that because this is sort of in, in process, I believe. And Vanessa has um, personal experience of the, the recent 2019 bushfires. 
Um, so I wanted to, to start um, with asking our panellists very briefly a little bit about the, the project um, that they are working on or have worked on. And I want to ask you um, one question at this stage. When did you know that this project was special? So at what point did you realise, hang on, I think, I think this is really important? So I'm going to start, um, I might start in chronological order. So we might start with Marnie talking about the Into the Light Festival following the 2009 fires in Victoria. So what, when did you know that Into the Light was special? Um, thanks, Amanda. Can I just, before I go back, I just want to say that um, Into the Light was very much a collaboration with community. Yes. And also with my colleague, Steph Robinson. So um, it's definitely not my project, but a project that I was part of getting um, across the line year after year after year after year. And I don't know that we ever knew it was special. I just knew it was crucial right from the start. That's all. It just was like, it mattered because everyone was in um, a bad state, like a, not a bad state, but a lot of state. And a lot of, it was very clear that there was a really clear need and we had heard that from community. We've experienced it ourselves. We saw it. So we just knew stuff had to happen. Mm. Um, yeah. Could you maybe just sort of explain how it, a little bit about what it was and how it developed as well? Yeah. Um, so, so I'd been working in that community already. It was a regional community. I'd been working there already to try to celebrate, you know, country, the past, the Landscape was changing, developments were coming. So I already had relationships with artists and community in that area. And then on the day of the fires, I was um, facilitating a, working with community facilitating a festival. So we were kind of, so I was sort of in the midst of it all right from the start. And so within a few weeks, people came and said to me, oh, you know, all that work that we were doing before those workshops, those things that kind of didn't make a huge amount of sense. We kind of get it now. That's what we need. So it felt like a very clear, um, request from community to have creative um, expression as a possibility and to facilitate that for people. And so there was a whole palaver around getting funding, but then when we finally got some funding, there was um, the original plan because you have to put a plan in to get funding, which makes no sense. So we just made a plan and then went back to community and they're going, that's not right. That's not how we're going to do it. We're going to do it like this. I'm like, okay, like whatever, let's just do what you need to do. And that was, that became the thing. Like, what do you guys need? What do you need next? And let us facilitate that. And so that happened. And what they wanted was workshops with no outcome, no commitment, no pressure, because it was about pressure. Um, but it was also about having an open space to just see what came up and where that would go and not to have to, well, how can you know where you're going when you haven't been there before? So to be mm. able to go on that journey. Um, and so that was that. But then I suppose we, I, we knew that we also had to come up with an outcome in some way because of the funding body. So I guess that's where our practice came in. So we looked at what was being made by people and, and, what, and then we crafted that into something that could be presented back to an audience. I mean, and that wasn't just about funding bodies. That's also about letting the the work that those individuals that so there was artists that were leading the workshops there was community members at the workshops and then we wanted to let the the benefit of those two layers flow further out to the public their neighbors their communities by um, staging it in some sort of way that general public could be involved so mm. that became a kind of participatory performance ritual and that was about drawing on our practice. My colleague and I had worked in a large-scale outdoor ritual theatre company, so we drew on our practice around ritual and outdoors. And all those things just gelled in a way that felt like it was the right outcome, right form. So in the end, it was a, a yeah, in the end, it became a, a kind of lantern parade that happened year after year. But everything else changed. There was many layers of engagement. There was live music, there was poetry, there was... Um, there was film writing, there was sculpture, <laughs> there was light, there was projections, there was all sorts mm -hmm. of things and, and each year the floor plan changed of the parade and that, that reflected where the community was at at the time. You know, one year was spiralling in towards um, a pool of water and, and spiralling out again, hoping to kind of leave, not leave everything behind, but to cool ourselves, to kind of cool calm but another year we were in concentric circles acknowledging that different people were on different paths at the same time but all around the same 
central event. Um, at another year, we we're winding back and forward past various sort of symbolic, various sculptural installation moments that had different symbology and so forth. So, mm. yeah, the form definitely followed the content. Yeah, and I remember you saying that um, sometimes imposing a process um, that that can work elsewhere doesn't often work in in a, a disaster affected community. And one of the things that struck me about Into the Light is it was so fluid, and it changed from year to year according to to what the community wanted and where they wanted to go. So that was a really interesting yeah. process. And I think that that's really important because that was about recognizing that the the thing that happened on that day for most people, if you want to kind of go generic, was that everyone lost control, you know, that, mm. that all sorts of things were taken away, you know, homes, people, but also identities, security, faith in the world. Um, so no one had any choice, a lot of choices to make on that day. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of choices. And then in the aftermath, you know, people were just sort of surviving. So to let people be able to make choices and, and, speak for themselves and say what they needed, even if it's as simple as what colour that's going to be or what shape that's going to be or what path that's going to be, that thing of creating spaces for people to make their own choices and, and find their own path and um, be empowered, even just to a minimal level, felt like the kind of fundamental thing. Mm, yeah. And then, of course, beauty is always good for people. So in the end, <laughs> if they have a beautiful thing, it's good. It's good. Yeah, which actually, actually brings me on to um, Christopher and um, the, the symbols of bushfire recovery, because one of the interesting, or I, this is what I found interesting, um, and so to put this in context, this is, this is um, Tasmania after the 2013 fires there, um, which were, I think, the largest fires in Tasmania since 1967, so it was quite significant. Um, but your project, Symbols of Bushfire Recovery, was, I think, the, the only funded creative project. So there's a whole lot of projects that um, were, were funded in your area, but you were the, the only sort of creative project that was sort of suggested and got up, which is really interesting because, um, well, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about it and, and how important it was and why you found it special. And I'll mention that you're on mute, Chris. You, you might want to take, take yourself off mute. Thanks very much, Amanda. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, there were some other projects which really uh, uh, aimed at very young children, run by the neighbour of the house, who was a, a partner in our project, along with my wife, Diane McPherson. Um, but yes, the, what was interesting process that the, there was a lot of funding. What amazed us, we lived through the fires and um, everything around our house was burnt except uh, obviously us and the house. <laughs> we went to the beach, we lived near the beach. Actually, it gives me an opportunity to simply say, just, just uh, because a lot of other people are, are watching and listening, is that uh, everyone should have a fire plan um, and, and prepare for, uh, for uh, if they're going to be confronted with a fire to know exactly what to do. And our plan was to go to the beach for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And as I said to my wife, we'd go back and see if the house is still there and it was. Then we spent the rest of the next six or eight hours putting out fires. So that really motivated us to want to do something. So a lot of money came in and that's, that's what amazed us, how much money was given privately and, and obviously through government. And, and people were called, uh, asked for proposals of how to recover from the fire. And these were then put out to the general public so that the public could then vote on what was ex uh, uh, they thought was a good project. And interestingly, most of them were infrastructure projects, in other words, for rebuilding. Not many, not many um, uh, mental reconstruction, you could, might say. And so um, one, our project was to to organise to employ artists that had been affected by the fire, maybe had lost their uh, income and had their um, studios. studios and houses destroyed, which, which had, did happen. Um, and uh, so therefore, we gave, that was um, the, the sort of objective to try and sort of stimulate creativity and employment for the people that actually did have their places destroyed. Um, so that was advertised uh, to the community and the community chose our project 
over and above uh, a number of others. Very few creative projects, so mostly infrastructure. And so we, we organised 12 artists to run ultimately 20 workshops over a period of since 2000, the late 2013, uh, finishing in early 2018. So it ran over a long period of time really, partly because um, it takes a lot of time to organise people. It's like herding cats, <laughs> getting, getting people together to, uh, to uh, be available at special times uh, for the workshops, organising the space, finding the spaces. One of the things that we found was, unfortunately, in where we are, there's not a lot of spaces, special spaces. We're actually trying to encourage the, the local council to develop special spaces for people to to uh, undertake these sorts of things. So that's, that was the, the interesting thing about ours, that, the, that the, the projects were advertised, the committee voted on it, and we carried it through. Uh, through and, and I guess it wouldn't have happened if we weren't prepared to volunteer our time. The money, all the money was given to the artists uh, with a bit towards our administrative expenses. Um, we just said to the artists, what's your professional fee? after we found the people we wanted. What's your professional fee? And no, no quibbling. They, they said this is, uh, and, which was surprising and that really the fees weren't hugely expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and we provided all the materials and, uh, and the spaces, organized the spaces and people simply were to turn up and there was no charge. Materials provided, no fees. Um, people came along to the workshops and uh, and uh, essentially, you know, that was, gave them an opportunity to, to recover from the experiences they had. Well, ideally, everyone had experienced the fire in some way, the tutors and the participants. Poster. Yeah. And so what, what was the response from the community, the people that came to the workshops? Oh, I think that we had some really interesting responses. I mean, one of the responses from, we, we put, sent out feedback um, forms and, from one of the tutors uh, who was running a basket making workshop, uh, she said there were people who came along to her workshop that were remaking baskets that were destroyed in the bushfire. Mm -hmm. So it gave, that just gives uh, one example. Uh, two, I, obviously I don't want to go on with lots of different examples, but I thought that was a key example mm -hmm. uh, whereby their work had been destroyed. They'd been to this person's workshop in the past They'd made their baskets, uh, and uh, she, this person's a very experienced, uh, the tutor, very experienced basket maker and tutor, and, and uh, these people felt so strongly that they wanted to come back and recreate something that had been destroyed in the fire. Mm, beautiful. The fire was a big fire, but it's called the Dunalley Bush Fire, but it covered something like 30 kilometres by 15 kilometres. I, I just had a look on Google Earth a while ago just to check up after. Uh, thinking now, how big was it? Adelaide is a small town. It has the only working sea canal in Australia uh, that enables people to to sail from Hobart to, around to the east coast of Tasmania, so they don't have to go right down around the southernmost tip, which is very rough in heavy weather, where the mm. Sydney Hobart yachts uh, travel. Um, and you often see on 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 the news. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting place, it's just a small town, but the fire was much bigger than just the small town. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it was huge. Thank you. Yeah, just, I mean, that, that's one of the posters we did. Just, you can see there oh, yeah. drum making <laughs> shop and uh, uh, an animation workshop. So, you know, and you had ast astrophotography as well, didn't you? Which I think is extraordinary. <laughs> How beautiful. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, now, Vanessa, I um, would love you to talk a little bit about um, the Arbor Festival, which I believe existed before the fires and then was scrapped and now has re-emerged in a, like a phoenix into a totally different thing. Um, so I think it's kind of obvious that you, you tried to put it aside, didn't you? And then then obviously that was not okay with everyone. <laughs> they wanted to they wanted to see it happen. So could you um, perhaps explain what the idea was originally, and then now what's what it's turning into? Because this is in process, isn't it? This one. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, and Arbor Festival will be happening um, over an ambitious 50 days uh, from 28th of December to the 15th of February, which is the anniversary of the Duns Road fire uh, up in the Snowy Valleys area. Um, it's something that... Um, I was in the process of working on um, in the middle, the, the second half of last year and talking with New South Wales Forestry and a number of other agencies about having an arts festival, a public arts festival up in an area known as the Sugar Pine Walk. And uh, anyone who's been up around the Snowy Valleys area will be familiar with that. If you're not, uh, Google Sugar Pine Walk and you'll see some absolutely stunning images of uh, a stand of sugar pines that were planted almost 100 years ago and uh, really was an, an amazing attraction for tourists. Lots of locals got married there and the like as well and just quite beautiful in the middle of the Bago um, State Forest. So um, I was in the process of doing that uh, and then um, the fires came. Um, my family's up there uh, on a farm and, uh, and I, I'm in Wagga and live in Wagga, but I've got a place in Tumbarumba as well. So, um, an abridged version is that I had, um, I, was, I was up there with everyone for Christmas. Most of the family left, but on New Year's Eve, we were hit by the fire. Um, and um, so my folks and myself were there. We, um, we uh, talk about this really um, important point that Christopher said about having a fire plan. We had sprinklers, we had a bunker. Uh, the, the farm is surrounded and vineyard is surrounded by uh, Kosciuszko National Park and State Forest and Nature Reserve as well. We always knew there was no way in or out if there was a fire and we knew that the RFS wouldn't be able to get to us. So, um, and thank goodness we knew that because of, of how fierce it was and, um, and um, how prolonged the um, firestorm essentially went for. So on my way into sheltering into the bunker, the last I heard, even though it was we were being completely inundated, the last I heard was that um, it had come from the sugar pines from around there. So you automatically presumed that they were lost and they were lost uh, and that um, Tumbarumba was being impacted where my place was. And um, that, um, and we were being impacted as well. So, it's an interesting. Christopher, you said that ten to fifteen minutes. We we thought the same as well. That it was. Uh, we always thought that if we were to shelter, it'd just be for ten to fifteen minutes. But it was for three hours, uh, and um, having the um, repeated fronts come at us. But um, anyway, so that's I suppose a bit of context and background there. After the fire, um, it probably would have been. Um, maybe only about six or eight weeks afterwards, I'd sugar pines were lost and in the process of being logged because they were a safety issue. So they are completely gone now, but they have been harvested, the timber. Uh, but um, the amazingly talented and supportive Tim Kurilovich from Eastern River and Arts, the executive director there, and hi TK, I know you're tuning in, um, that um, he was really supportive. And uh, the festival I was working on was really focused on cultural tourism, about bringing people to the area from outside of the area and showing them the amazing natural beauty uh, that was there as well as some site specific artworks as well um, to really highlight that. So, and, and Tim pointed out to me how needed this was for the community um, and that, um, that we should look at this from the perspective of allowing, providing an opportunity for the community to heal and to recover. And it's been the most amazing journey ever since. And we were lucky to get support from Create New South Wales and a number of other funding bodies as well. Um, and as we started talking to people and that first question that you asked Amanda about how did you know that this was important, that as soon as we started talking to locals about what we're planning to do, it just resonated so strongly with people. Um, as I said, the fire ran for 50 days. And as Christopher said that, you know, everyone was impacted. Everyone's got a story. It, um, everyone's got an anniversary as well. There's 50 days of anniversaries. So for me, it's New Year's Eve. For, um, for the town of Batlow, it's, um, I think it's about the 4th of January. Um, some people were early on. Some people have repeated anniversaries because they got hit a number of times. So, um, and being a, a rural and regional area, um, not, all, not everyone is as blessed as me as to be able to be talking about it all day, every day. Uh, that um, there's a lot of people that can't. And, um, and I'm sure that Christopher and um, Marnie will be able to provide insight into those anniversaries. And as people are recovering that, um, 
you know, people recover in different ways. So the ability for people to, um, uh, not everyone can talk about it. So the ability for them to either just participate in something on the anniversary, either passively or actively, but to be, whether it's as a distraction or whether it was, or whether it's as an, an, um, an, a targeted active way to help themselves in healing, that um, it's, it's something that I think that by providing that variety and those options for people, it seems to be really um, resonating with, um, with, with so many people around the area, uh, with locals, not just people that are involved in arts, arts and cultural activities, but, um, but, but the locals that are being impacted. And the other thing that we're really finding with Arbor, it's providing a, an amazing platform for um, agencies and, and NGOs to be able to provide their support as well and to get involved. So. Uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service, Forestry Corporation have been amazing, uh, and um, uh, Department of Primary Industries, all of these agencies that might be working in isolation um, otherwise that are all coming together as a part of this program, working side by side with the community. Um, much of the, much of the, many of the facilitators and artists are impacted by the fires themselves. And, um, and really whilst Whilst tourists and, and um, people from other areas are certainly most welcome, our primary audience is the local community. The secondary audience now is, is uh, visitors to the region. So it's, it's flipped. Uh, it's certainly evolved and, um, and it's a real privilege to be involved with this, um, for this in this lead up to this one year anniversary because it's going to be so, so important for so many people and, um, and such a stressful time. So what we're able to do, um, and I should mention and point out the huge support we're getting from Creative Recovery Network as well to make sure that we are, um, we're very conscious and aware of, um, of the communities that we're going into and, and the trauma that they have experienced um, and, and really acknowledging that and, um, and working with them and uh, Creative Recovery Network have been fantastic at guiding us through that to make sure that we are doing that properly and um, we're not just walking in saying, don't worry, we'll help you. Um, that, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing journey and yeah, we're still, we're still in the process of getting there, but um, it's, uh, it's coming together as a quite a, quite a special program and uh, really looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's, um, it's going to be extraordinary, I think. Um, I wanted to, to perhaps ask you all and, and whoever, which, whichever one wants to, wants to answer first. Um, we, we sort of got together a little while ago and had a, had a brief chat and we, we briefly touched on, on something I thought was very interesting, which was the, I guess, the, the role of creativity and creative practice in a post-disaster environment in, in creating a space where people want to engage that might not engage in other things, such as counselling and mental health support, um, for some reason, um, creative experiences are more accessible than, than even sort of sitting down and having a chat with a counsellor. I'd like to, um, you know, to, to ask you what's your experience of that and, and I guess the, um, the effect that your, your projects and creativity have had on, on community members. Marnie yeah, looks like she might say something. <laughs> you go. I mean, and we can all talk about that. I'm yeah, sure. but, um, I think you can. Yeah. I, I feel like the, I, I'm just interested to hear Vanessa talking about, you know, part of the thing of the festival is it's, it's not for the audience, obviously, it's for the participants and the locals mm -hmm. and stuff. And, and I think that um, the thing about art, really, and we all know this, is I, I, the thing I learned in that decade of stuff is that if you can um, take something from inside you and give it form outside of you, then you can separate out a little bit. You can see it for what it is. Sometimes you learn something about yourself. Sometimes you understand something about what you're struggling with. Sometimes you understand that you are struggling with something or sometimes you realise that maybe you're ready to kind of shift through something to the next layer of the onion or the next phase or whatever. So it feels like... Um, yeah, some people aren't ready to talk about things. So with art, you don't need to talk. You know, you don't even need to know what you're thinking about. You don't even need to think. 
you know, in fact, I think the most powerful thing is to not think and be tricked into just, you know, in our case, build a lantern, you know, and, and sometimes we just, we used to talk about it as like secret art or, you know, accidental art. So we just go, it's not art, you're just making a lantern, like just come and make a lantern. And I mean, one example is I remember working with a woman in, the, in a workshop in the first year and I was really anxious. So Steph is like, lanterns that's the thing we need to do and I was really anxious because they have a little candle in them and I'm going why are you serious yeah we're bringing flame and and we're making this in this workshop and I was this this woman who said um how's this going to work and I was like well you put the sticks like this and the paper there and and then there's a candle and she went candle and I went yeah no what do you think about that and she goes well I think it's okay. I said, there's three layers of safety. You know, the sticks make a big enough space that there's, you know, and then we soak the paper in PVA and that's a fire retarder. And then in the parade, if something happens, there's all these people, with, you know, extinguishers and buckets and water and C, you know, S, um, CFA and all the rest. And she was going, I think it's about, I think what I'm doing is rebuilding my relationship with flame, but in a situation where I'm in control, it's little and I'm big and I'm putting the space around it and I'm choosing whether I carry it or not. And, I'm, and I was just like, oh my God, yes, that's what you're doing, brilliant. But I didn't even understand that. And that had just been an intuitive thing from Steph, who's an artist. And I feel like that's the thing. You can let your intuition um, tell you what is the right thing for you to do next. And art gives you a form for that. And then sometimes when you get that out, whether that's you know, poetry, whether that's visual, sculpture, movement, whatever, it's something that you can then um, reflect on and go, oh, that's what's going on for me. Now that I, it sort of helps that process. So, you know, with trauma, I mean, you know, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I think there's some really basic kind of brain stuff that we understand that, you know, the part of the brain that gets changed with trauma is a really pre-verbal, prehistoric part that sits right in the middle. And um, the plasticity of the brain, you know, we know now that, that that actually changes. And so the healing process can mean that it can change again possibly not back to what it was, but to something again. So there's a process from where things have to shift from the subconscious to the conscious. And if we drag them out by being forced to answer psychologist questions when we're not ready, for instance, which is one thing that happened to me, that can re-traumatise you apparently. So um, the thing I think that art offers is the opportunity to engage in incredibly simple physical activities that are quite mindless. And sometimes when you've really got brain fog going on or you're super kind of emotional, you don't want to have to think about it, you don't want to have to talk about it, just something very simple can happen and in that you can engage in conversations with other people if you're in a workshop or not, so there can be a sense of shared experience with other people and then ultimately there can be an outcome that gives you a tiny sense of productivity at the very least but connection to others potentially and then maybe even some insight into what's like going on for yourself or your community that can actually help you kind of understand consciously what's going on subconsciously that can help you take yourself on the next step. Mm. That's what I feel is useful. Yeah, yeah. And Crystal, Vanessa, did you? Thank you, Marnie. That's, um, that's wonderful. Um, Christopher, Vanessa, have you sort of witnessed that, I guess, that um, un, unplanned sort of unstructured sort of building of, of relationships and unravelling and unpacking things in, in, your, in your process at all? I think um, one of the things that we realised in run, on running our workshop is actually we also benefited. We, yeah. we, we, we I was going to ask that next. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> a lot of benefit through the feedback sheets from the people that participate in the workshops. Um, um, and, and so it was fairly obvious in the sense because there wasn't a negative comment received at all. Mm. But then, only, it was only probably last year or the year before, really, after we'd been running the, the, the thing for a long time, we thought, oh, and actually, I think it, and only, we, we only realised it when it's actually somebody told us and said, look, we think you're benefited from this. Mm. And, um, and so we thought, yeah, from reflection we had, because though anyone who's, lived, who's been through any trauma, I think and it's impossible to explain I think what it feels like and they should experience it. And so we found ourselves for the first probably 18 months very clearly, it was very difficult to focus on things. And, and in fact, to such an extent that we started the, the 
the um, project and we had an artist uh, who was going to do the first workshop but she was so badly traumatized because her studio and her house was destroyed that she she just was not able to undertake the, the work and so it all came to a, a screaming halt and then we went to the Di and I went to the Kalgoorlie um, Regional Arts Conference and we actually went to a discussion by Scotia Montjevic uh, um, and uh, we, uh, we we suddenly realised that um, what we'd been doing was actually worthwhile and and that we really had to press on because we were having quite a lot of difficulty up until then and to the extent that the the funding body had written to us and said look we think we should withdraw the funds you you, you sort of come to a bit of a hole so we we put a document together and said look no we think actually it's better to leave it a while and and we put up a persuasive argument and we were dealing with the um, Premier's Department, the man in the Premier's Department. He obviously went and talked to the panel that were, had handed out the money. They were very good. They accepted our argument and, and said, carry on. And they've been very good in, in letting us spread it over a long time. And actually, we think the community's benefited from that by having it last over a long time. And, and um, the... Uh, the, the business of going to that talk of the conference, and I mean, this is why conferences are so good, aren't they? In the sense that what's coming up all being well in Launceston next year, um, it gives people opportunity, particularly through COVID times, um, to be able to, all being well, it'll happen, and we'll, people will be able to talk about all these things. Um, just to slip in one disappointing thing in Tasmania is uh, our regional arts organisation was closed down a few years ago, and we think that it would have been great, really important to have that organisation. It was a membership organisation. It should, we really feel strongly that that has been a detriment to artists in uh, regional Tasmania. But anyway, that's an aside. What, what it, so this business of, of seeing a, and hearing a talk at a conference about trauma, um, we haven't built up a direct connection um, in the sense that because we're not specialists in that area, we, we've done a lot of community workshop projects and, and exhibitions, but we didn't see ourselves as specialising in trauma recovery, but on reflection, we think, yes, we've learned a lot and we probably should make a bigger connection that, to that organisation. Um, but um, uh, and, and, and we, we sort of, we don't feel that we should be, um, I suppose, um, dwelling on it and, and I'm sure the rest of you in the, in the panel would have come across this. A lot of people just won't talk about fire. They just want to get on and move on. But I think what the arts does, it offers people an opportunity who do want to talk about it and do want to express things to actually do something. And that's really, I think, what the creative process is about. It gives people an opportunity. They're not forcing it down their throat. They're saying, here's an opportunity, come along and do something. And uh, we see the results in what they actually end up doing. Yeah, and it's. I think it's nice to give people a, an opportunity to either participate or to watch or to to not be part of it or to talk about it to somebody else who's participated. It gives them a range of options that I think um, just a, a counselling session can't can't quite give. Like it's sort of a it's sort of a different a different op opportunity for them. Yeah. What what have you found so far, Vanessa? Because you're still in the middle of everything, aren't you? So what have you found with I guess the um, that um, you know that that sort of healing path and and people taking up you know those opportunities and how they're feeling. Yeah, absolutely agree with um, everything that Marnie and Christopher have said, and I think it's and I find it really valuable because we're all in different stages of recovery with 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 our communities and the like. So it's it's fascinating to hear. Um, but yeah, obviously still very much in the early stages um, here and, but also even within that, there's, there's so much um, diversity in how people are responding and, and reacting mm. to what's happened. So um, for me personally, and I've been really quite open about it, that I've sought counselling um, quite early on as well, which helped sort of equip me with those tools. And I'm, I am very conscious that I, I could, I could, 
dive into this in to such a degree that would actually not do me any good. And then, uh, so I'm, I'm always trying to make sure that I, I pull back a little bit. And, but as Christopher said, it, it helps you, you as well. Like this is a bloody good distraction for me for the anniversary. I'll be flat out. Uh, but uh, it's, um, it's really, um, I think for, for the community, as I said, they're, they're in various stages of recovery. And, and I first realized that, um, I suppose, unorthodox uh, ways that people can recover is through um, Blaze Aid. We've, we've had them, uh, mm. they're only just sort of finishing mm. up now, um, but they've been there. And the idea of, of the volunteers standing there side by side with the farmer, and uh, there's, there's no pressure of eye contact and other mm. kind of social and um, uh, social cues and the like, and just talking. And, you know, you're there working, doing, you know, uh, fencing wire and things like that. that and I, I, you can't underestimate the importance of organisations like them. And that, but that really helped me realise that the power of the arts works in, in a way in a similar um, um, in a similar scenario in that you're not necessarily sitting there one on one, as you said, Amanda, you're not sitting there opposite a counsellor um, and, and, and being told to tell your story that, um, that you, you're, you're unravelling and sharing as much or as little as you want to, as you're comfortable to do so. Um, and I think that, and I think that the variety of with what, what we're presenting as a part of Arbor and what, what many other projects present is that variety of options for people to do that um, and for them to feel comfortable to do that. Um, that it's something that I think um, can't be, yeah, you can't underestimate the value of that, that, um, that so many, uh, so many people can't can't respond directly to that conventional mm. uh, version of um, of healing or, or recovery. That, um, that that's um, it's much more organic and dynamic than um, than any sort of textbook can uh, can tell you. But um, but yeah, as I said, everyone's in different phases. I think people are just now starting to come out of that initial recovery. Um, you know, it's but it's still still a traumatic time. You know, we're, we're, we've got a vineyard that we're in the middle of starting, sorry, to pull out now. So it's that there's still that real grief and that loss that's still um, that's happening, and it's happening for other people. I'm speaking to farmers in other areas. They I said, oh, how are you going with your fencing? You'd be just about done. Oh, I haven't even started. Um, our our neighbour lost his place. Um, he's um, he's at a point now where he's just getting the um, the brickwork. Um, the place is just starting. The new place is just starting to come out of the ground. So it's, but the weather's warming up. The wind, uh, that warm wind, is coming, um, and um, the um, grass is just starting to dry off. We've had a wet winter. Uh, there's a lot of long grass around, and. Um, no, this summer no one's going anywhere. So um, there's there's a lot um, there's a lot of stress yet to come that um, that we've got to be really conscious of over the next few months, um, and even 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 after the anniversary as well. That um, I think there's um, there's there's a lot to be aware of uh, in terms of those um, yeah those those responses that that um, or reactions that people are going to be having over the next few months. Yeah. As Vanessa said, um, the, uh, the, the mental trauma is very evident as time goes on. And we had the 50th anniversary of the 67 bushfires just a couple of years mm. ago. And, and that was a major exhibition in the Museum and Art Gallery in Hobart. And people brought along things that they've uh, kept from that fire. And there were things obviously in the exhibition. And one of the things that would happen here, which was very effective, Rob Gordon, who's a, a specialist in trauma, was brought over three times and spoke in the school hall. That's the only building in the school that survived. The rest of it burnt down. And he described very clearly how Di and I felt. Um, and what was interesting is the hall was full the first session and then about two thirds the second session and about a third the last or less than a third the last session. I don't think people actually realise how long that sort of experience lives in their mind. They're trying to put it out of their mind. And that's why I think that um, in a sense, what we found in doing the workshops that lasted over a, a longer period of time, it, it then people have started realized, ah, oh, yes, I'm still wanting to do something that expresses how I feel. Mm. 
Mm, that's right. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's extraordinary that um, you know there was an this such a big response to fires that happened fifty years ago. Although you know, I think you lost about over sixty people in those fires, um, and they were huge. Yeah, in, we were lucky yeah. that no one was uh, no one died in the in the, the Dun Alley fire. Yeah, um, yeah. But, um, that was because most people living in water. Anyone who's inland, there's obviously uh, you know. As Vanessa was just talking about, that becomes, I think, quite a different sort of scenario. Mm, mm. Um, I'd like to, to sort of share with you some, some words that are actually from Marnie, um, which um, we were sort of emailing each other. And um, uh, there's a question I'd like to sort of finish up and ask you all. But um, she's, she's written that, um, you know, as, as a creative practitioner um, in this environment, she said, um, we have to work hard to stay an empty vessel and let the fire and fury of people's distress wash through us, to be compassionate but not take it personally um, because it's not us that they're hurt by, um, which I think is a, a beautiful way of sort of describing what a creative facilitator does. Um, and I want to ask um, all of you too that, you know, all of you have been affected by those, those individual fires. The creative people, the artists that you work with were also affected by the fires. How did this impact the work that you all did? How did you survive it? And how did you take care of yourselves? Um, I'm happy to go first, if you guys like. Yeah, have um, a go. The, at, at first, I couldn't, I couldn't work out what it was. And then I heard this term and it summed it up perfectly for me. And it's solastalgia. Um, and I'm not sure if people are, have, heard, for, have heard of it before, but um, I think it was a phrase that was coined about 10 years ago. And originally you've got, uh, you've all heard of nostalgia um, and we've got a, a version of what that means. You know, you, you see a, a, a toy from when you were a kid and you go, oh, you know, that was, I used to love that or a TV show or something. But really it stemmed from the First World War and just that fear and horror that, um, that the soldiers felt and this longing and yearning for them to, um, to be home, to just, to just to be home and to be out of that. And, and it's such a powerful thing when you think about that with, with you know, what, what we think nostalgia means. It's just, it's just evolved so much. So, soul nostalgia is about the impact um, or, or the, the grief and the loss and that emotion that you feel um, with the, the sudden loss or, or change or destruction to your environment. Um, and for me, that's been huge, absolutely huge. And just yesterday I spent um, a couple of hours in the bush uh, next to the farm and just going through there and just an absolute roller coaster of emotions because of what I was seeing, um, the, um, the lack of regeneration that just with the, the, the ferocity of, of, of the fire that, um, you know, that the soil's dead. Uh, in so many parts and it's just nothing will grow, uh, will be growing there um, and not regenerating. So, you know, something that with with climate change, we would look at the at the ridge line before the fire and see the impacts the, of the thinning because it's, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the impacts of the change in the environment that was happening as part of that. And now it's just this skeleton that, you know, you see it at the last light of the day and it's the skeleton of the, um, the, of the black tree trunks there that, um, that are on that ridge. And it's just, it's, that grief is just so raw and real when you see that. So that's what really has been driving me now. What's been driving me as a part of the fellowship that I'm doing, which is really investigating that. And how does that impact on the artists? Um, and it's quite, and it's quite significant and, and really varied in, in my discussions with the fire impacted artists that I've been working with. So um, it's something that um, is still, well, you know, I'm still in that exploration phase, but it's something as, as straightforward as an artist who was using charcoal before in their work is now using charcoal from, from the fire on their property. Um, that um, uh, others are actually not at a point where they, that they're, that they're wanting to interpret their experiences. So it's, yeah, it's quite amazing that that variety of, of what's happening, but, but that sort of nostalgia is something that seems to be really underpinning for so many people, and particularly for those of us living in regional areas, um, you know, our environment, our landscape and, and nature that we're surrounded by is, 
is so intrinsically linked to who we are uh, and to our, our identity. So I think it's, um, for me, that's the core of it that I've found. Yeah. Marnie, how did you and your team <laughs> survive <laughs> over so many years of Into the Light? And, how, and did that change over the years? Um, yeah, it did. Uh, I would, so I, I don't think I did a particularly good job of looking after myself and certainly early on I didn't know that I needed to and I don't think anyone else really did either. Everyone was, I mean, in our area there was a lot of obviously, yeah, people were grief stricken at loss of um, friends, family, homes, security, identity and landscape, as you said, Vanessa and also um, survivor guilt. So there was a, a really complex bunch of things going on for a lot of people. So a lot of us were just sort of working really hard and fast to do whatever we could, whenever we could to, for anyone. So the idea of self-care was kind of like completely foreign, the world's away. But then a lot of people crashed and burned and then you realise that you actually, if you're going to do anything at any point for anyone, including yourself, you actually have to do some looking after yourself. But Really what people did was look after each other, in our case, I would say, um, mm. because people could see each other falling apart, but they couldn't see themselves falling apart. So I think on that level it was really lovely to be surrounded by a team of artists, local artists, who'd all been through um, different versions of the same uh, fire experience. Mm. And, um, and people called each other out, not in a bad way, but in a kind of like, you know, take care of this. But also... You know, we did experience triggers and we did um, kind of lose it at silly things and then get really emotional at other things. And people were very um, kind of understanding and accommodating and supportive in a way because they knew what was going on. And, and you could even get to the point of going, you know, how are you going today? And you go, don't talk to me today. Just not, you know. And I go, okay, fine. Not in a bad way, but in a kind of really, um, okay, it's not a good day. Today's a good day. Today's a bad day, whatever that stuff. So I feel like what we did was look after each other in the early stages or people, everyone, not, I mean, I don't mean me as in people I knew, but the whole community was busy looking after itself, uh, each other mm. within that, strangers, everyone. And then, yes, all those other organisations like Blaze Aid and stuff came in and that was a really, um, that kind of was the same thing, of people looking after each other. And then down the track, a few years down the track, then people realised they needed to do some self-care and, took yeah. more kind of gave that more attention then but but I mean and look not to when we we're talking earlier about art stuff not to dismiss the power of counselling mm. um just at different strokes for different folks but for me at, at some point and it, for a bunch of other people at some point counselling was really important too it just yeah. took a couple of years to get to that place where you realised that maybe there was something going on mm. <laughs> Mm, yeah, no, yeah, counselling certainly is important. Um, it's not often readily embraced. Um, no, exactly. Yeah. And and it's also um, different things at different points. Yeah. Too, so it's not yeah. always the right thing straight away or something. Yeah, that's right. Oh, if right. I answered that particularly. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. <laughs> Chris, yeah, no, I'll just remind us that we're, we're probably going to move on to um, our question and answers fairly soon, but I'd like to hear, Christopher, what you have to say as well. Um, one, yeah. of the, one of the groups of people that we catered for in the sense that unexpectedly, I suppose you could say in a way, was people that were told to leave their house and mm. didn't know whether they were going, to back, going back to a place to live. And mm. so they weren't all directly affected by a fire coming through. Um, well, there's a, an area nearby that a lot of people were told to leave their house because they, the authorities thought the fire was going to come to their place and uh, so they many of those people came along to the workshops they they, they just simply were traumatized by the fact that they didn't know whether they were going to have a home to return to and the other mm -hmm. thing is, uh, no, the neighborhood house that um, joined us in this project they backed us in the project uh, they ran sessions of uh, you know um, uh, what do you call it um, uh, meditation. Uh, meditation. <laughs> you know, so, you've got a prompter off screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, uh, yeah, that's a die. She, she, because she's a participant, so she, she's yeah. listening. <laughs> she wanted to hear what, how it all went. Um, but yeah, because I mean, it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the two of us. There was a lot of work in this project, mm. uh, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, and 
we it's a, a small team, whereas we weren't organising a festival or anything like that. So it's a small project in many ways, but being in its impact, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, do, I just want to pick up on something that Chris said and look at our, our experiences like over 10 years ago, and we've learned a lot in the space in between. But, you know, early on, people would be distinguishing whether they were, you know, directly affected or indirectly affected and how affected and then it took only a couple of years to realize that like everyone was affected because if you're in a community alongside people that are suffering deep grief or deep loss or deep pain or deep anxiety or anything then you're also um, going to be affected by that because mm. you know you, you help one individual heal and then the ripples go out like a pond you know they're healthier individuals that can help others but equally if someone's suffering then the people around them are going to suffer and then that's going to flow out to a community too. So it felt like it was an important thing for us when a couple of years in we just went, you know what, everyone is affected. And it's really just about who, when, where, how and how, how what you want to do about it. It's, it's not about, you know, what your experience was, but about owning that being part of that community means that you're, you're in that story. Yeah, and I, I think in certainly in my experience and, and um, listening to your stories and, and, and looking at some of your work, I think that um, the creative work you do actually fosters an environment where, where people um, are, are able to take care of each other and to look out for each other and, and to form strong connections. I know we, um, we have spoken before about um, one of the, um, the most important things that come, comes out of this are, are very powerful connections within a community. So it's, it's real community building stuff that, that this work does. Um, so look, we're going to maybe stop here and move on to q and I've sort of noticed a couple of really interesting questions popping up and I think um, Mary Jane's going to take it from here. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yep. Amanda. Thank uh, firstly, you. just want to say a grateful, heartfelt thank you to all of you. That was really um, touching. And I, I lived through the 2009 um, fires in Victoria myself and it's um, touched me personally as well as professionally. So thank you. It's really um, really interesting also how you're all at different phases of recovery and that's something we're very interested in at Regional Arts Australia is understanding how those different phases of recovery play out and just how long that process is. Um, so thanks just for me. But also um, we've got some a couple of really good questions. Um, what it's We've just got two minutes to go on the time but we'll keep recording and keep going a little bit over time just to get to these questions. So um, if people need to leave they can and the recording will be available on our website. Um, so the, the question I'm going to ask first is from Duke and Duke is currently studying, has a long history of socially engaged arts projects and is currently studying a master's in arts therapy and is interested in integrating that in the recovery and resilience projects. So Duke's question is, did you underpin your projects with any theory or literature regarding the benefits of creative responses? Yeah, Shimani, you're muted. <laughs> um, yes, ish. In the, for us in the early days, we were lucky enough to, I mean, you know, Whittleson was like flooded with um, counsellors and a lot of kind of emotional support workers. And so when we started working with community, which um, not like our, when we started this project, it was really 18 months in. And so we kind of brought together a group of artists that were interested and worked with community. And we, in that, what we called our dreaming group, we invited um, a couple of other people that were sort of had been deeply in the community as well and they had skills around grief counselling and so they were contributing to our kind of creative conversations, dreaming, thinking, in structuring the projects and the activities and the opportunities and the workshops and that was really helpful. Um, and then, and we thought the first project was, was it, that would be just it and everything would be fine and then everyone in the community was like, no, this can't stop. You have to do it again. And we went, okay. This is a cautionary tale for Christopher and Jim, <laughs> <though>, isn't it? <laughs> so then we took ourselves off for, you know, and like it's tiny, but it was huge, just like a weekend intensive art therapy workshop and um, found ourselves in a room full of psychologists of all different kind of um, different sort of types and degrees and so forth. And we were the only two artists in the room. But the leader of it was saying, well, the artists are the ones that are actually best equipped for this work because it's all about listening to your intuition and letting your intuition guide you. And 
their art practice has told them to listen to their intuition already. So they're already, you know, got, got the kind of skills. So it was really fabulous for us to be in that weekend and learn a whole lot of technical stuff, learn, um, learn a whole lot of stuff. That, but then what we came out of it was like all that stuff in that weekend was about working with people one-on-one. And so we sort of set ourselves the kind of the challenge or the provocation of applying those principles as kind of broad brushes they were, as you could gather in a weekend, um, to a community process. So I would say on that level, yes, we were. And we did a lot of reading and stuff to support that. So the next few years, were um, we were trying to tap into that art therapy world in terms of practice and um, resources, information, background. But primarily, we'd been um, given the kind of mandate to trust our gut. So that's that's really what we did. And to listen to what people wanted to do and to respond to that and to really just sort of resource that. And then in the end, whatever was happening to bring our artistry to craft, whatever was happening into something that was presentable and palatable and um, that an audience could engage with. Great. Thanks, Marnie. Yeah. Vanessa, do, do you want to say something on that question? Yeah, thanks. It's something that um, that really has been involved from the from the outset with our project. That um, one of the um, first things that, that we did, that Tim Kurilovich did, was pick up the phone to Scotia at Creative Recovery Network, and we we really had had that um, um, that creative recovery essentially the the theory and framework embedded into into our original grant applications. In, ter in terms of what we were wanting to do. So um, we've always been so conscious of not just coming in. Um, I know that um, there's one farmer um, who said that um, when it comes to mental health, my biggest risk is a mental health support worker jumping out of the bushes um, at any given moment. So there are so, they're, they're, they're virtually parachuting out onto the ground at the moment. So it's something that we we're we're aware of that and there's there's valuable there's people there doing really valuable work but we want to make sure that we were also doing that valuable work as well so um as an example one workshop that um that i've got um, in the process of lining up at the moment is an oral history workshop so people can um, learn how to um, capture the stories from 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 the fire and the aftermath with family members but recognising that's going to trigger a lot of things, so we're making sure that we're that we're sort of packaging that up as well with some with some support to make sure that those that are, those that are participating in that 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 they that they have the the skills and the insight to be able to tell those signs of someone who's experiencing that trauma and, and knowing what to do as a part of it. So it's 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 un it's underlying in everything that we're doing as a part of it and um and uh but not in a in an obvious way that's um that's 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 in your face but it's certainly in terms of um being aware of the impacts of the mental health impacts on on people and what we are potentially bringing out through this festival is something that um that is yeah we're um we're constantly sort of keeping an eye on making sure that we can um we can address that and provide relevant support Great. Thank you. Um, Christopher, did you have anything on that particular question about the... Oh, I, I think, uh, like um, Mahoney and Vanessa have said, I mean, we, we'd uh, read, doc, uh, read uh, about uh, the potential benefits of uh, creative activities for recovering from trauma. Um, and we'd both been involved with regional arts here in Tasmania when it was operating and there were a number of occasions where uh, workshops and so on were held to uh, talk about all aspects of uh, creative arts um, process. So, you know, you build it up as over a period of time and, and Di and I are old enough to have had plenty of experience in that area. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it's it, it's one of those things. There is a, and as, as Mahoney said, there's a gut feeling, you know, that, that you you know, you, you know deep down that it's it's really important to our culture, to the whole business of creative arts, and it's important to the way people can find a, a route for recovery. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've just um, 
we have run out of time, definitely. So I'll hand back to Amanda to, um, to sign off. Um, but we can take those questions on notice. So I've just had from one of the panelists, happy to share um, details via Regional Arts Australia. So don't think those questions are lost. We'll record those and, um, and keep connecting with everyone. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. I just wanted to say um, thank you. I'm just, just having a, a little bit of a look at the chat and some of the amazing questions. I wish we had lots of <laughs> lots of extra time to answer them because there's some really terrific ones there. Um, but I'd also like to thank our, our wonderful panellists. You've um, Your work is, is, is quite inspirational. I think it's the sort of work that is um, really starting to get a little bit of um, attention and I think um, people are starting to really understand the value value of it and it's becoming a very, very interesting um, way of, of practicing. So um, thank you so much to Christopher, Vanessa and Marnie for, for joining us. It's, um, it's been a really interesting conversation and thank you for everybody who's come along to listen. Thanks. Thanks for having us.